that is going to be Ben McFarland from Seattle Pacific University, professor of biochemistry, who will talk about why we can't control chaos, theological insights from chemistry and philosophy. Good morning, everyone. Thank, and uh, thank you to my two fellow co-presenters, because we did not coordinate this, um, but it seems like at some level we did, because we're all talking about chaos, we're all physical scientists in one way or another. Um, and the other thing that I find fascinating about this, I don't know about the, um, the other two presenters, I wrote this abstract in February 2020, and the first cases of COVID only came out at the very end of that month that it was community spread in the US at the very least. And yet looking back on the last 18 months, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. So I think that this has been on our minds and this is something that um, God can speak through some of the chaos that we've been through as well as the, um, you know, the, the intentions that we had when we wrote these abstracts. So I do, I do want to go back, not to 2020, but I want to go back all the way to 1981. At Stanford, there was a symposium on order and disorder. And uh, they have the, the entire transcripts of it. They weren't able to record the talks, but we have the written versions of the talks, and we even have some of the discussions among the respondents. And I'm so glad that I was able to find this because this refers to my exact question. What about the universe can we control and can't we control? And we can talk about God's righteousness and what does God control and how does that work? How does that all fit together? And so this is not from a theological perspective, but it's from a, a interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, and in some cases, the people who spoke did speak from a theological perspective. The, um, the biggest two participants in the meeting was uh, Rene Girard, who was a um, French philosopher who moved to the US. And uh, he actually um, presented, he, he organized these kind of interdisciplinary conferences that had an effect on bringing people together. And one of the people that he brought together was a recent Nobel Prize winner, Ilya Prigogine, uh, who won for the study of irreversible thermodynamics, which is nonlinear dynamics, it's related to chaos theory. And uh, what Prigogine talked about was dissipative cycles. And they were trying to see if Prigogine's ideas could relate to the order and disorder that were in Rene Girard's ideas. And they actually got somewhere and then they ran into a wall. So I wanna talk about the history of that, what I've reconstructed from the document that you can find. And you can go and visit it as it goes right now. A little bit about Rene Girard, um, this is, he did not win the Nobel Prize, but he got nominated to the French Academy. They only have, I think, 40 seats and you stay on it until you die. So when someone dies, they then nominate some other French intellectual to take their place, their seat. And so he get, was elected to chair 37 in 2005. A few years later, he passed away, but he uh, was um, ironically enough, suppose, or it seems kind of French that they call them the immortals, okay? Um, clearly not literally true, but we have the idea of the intellectual immortality of the ideas. Um, so the, what were the ideas of Prigogine that Girard wanted to bring into contact with his own ideas? And these are the nonlinear dynamics. I'm going to present an example that is more chemical than physical, especially because Prigogine was a chemist first and foremost. So um, there's a movie, I'm not going to dare to show it to you, but it's Fingers and Holes in a Shaken Cornstarch Solution. And what this is, is basically it's unset pudding in a dish. And what you do is you shake it, you oscillate it at certain levels. And if you blow a hole in it with a straw, you can see that on the upper left, at some frequencies, the hole, you know, if you blow an unset pudding with a straw, you expect it to fill in. Well, if you shake it at certain frequencies, the hole will not fill in. You'll blow on it with the air and it will set up this sort of whirlpool that keeps the hole in place. Uh, and other frequencies, you actually will have the whirlpool will be expanding and it has this writhing mass that shows up. I have a few freeze frames from it. It's only about a two minute video. So I recommend that you do it. And I have the link to it at the end in my references section. The thing is, this is not the kind of chemical reaction that I studied in school. This has the input of energy that is somehow driving the reaction. 
And the reaction in some cases is staying in place. The whole stays in place. How does that happen? It happens not because you have one thing going on, but you have at least four things going on that are moving the energy through the system. Okay, so you have, uh, this is an example of what the whole might look like uh, in the shaken cornstarch solution. It really depends on the fact that you have um, flux going through the system that is dissipating the energy. The entropy of the universe is increasing. We know second law of thermodynamics, that has to happen. But what's happening is in the middle, you have a stable system that is recapitulating itself as it spreads out the rest of the universe more. So that's for cornstarch solutions. And uh, Prigogine studied things like the clock reaction, uh, these really fascinating reactions where the whole system changes in sync. It's not exactly like the EPR, but it's a little bit like it because you have distant atoms that are somehow communicating and they're changing in sync with each other. And Prigogine found out that, for example, you could model this if you had autocatalysis forming some kind of circle like what we were showing with the arrangement on the previous thing. So this works for chemical reactions. What else does it work for? Well, on the very large scale, our planet can be looked at this way as a dissipative system that dissipates the light energy from the sun. Shorter wavelengths get spread out to longer wavelengths. Plants capture that energy and give the energy to animals, and it goes around in a circle like that. Um, that's the big scale kind of model of this. And these, uh, my, my questions is, do these models fit better or worse? Which of these models is best for understanding how things work in our, and how chaos works? The important thing about dissipative systems, what you're dissipating is producing chaos. And so I want to get back to that uh, term that we've all been talking about. An individual, you follow dissipative dynamical logic. And the term that I'm using right here, as you breathe in and eat sugar, then you put out CO2 and heat, you have catabolism that breaks it down, anabolism that builds it up. And you stay in the middle, mostly the same. Uh, this idea is uh, tied together with ideas from uh, a third person I want to mention, Terence Deacon, who uh, talks about, uses this uh, dynamical logic. He details how this works out in several ways. This is metabolism, but also it could be applied to development, repair, immunity, um, and reproduction and evolution. And so I think this is possibly a fruitful framework for thinking about very different areas. And this is where I have a question sort of for y'all, because when I look at the Krebs cycle, I see that reactions one to four tend to be more breaking down. Reactions five to eight seem to be more building up. Could this be looked at as a dissipative cycle with a free energy axis on the y-axis? I have found one paper that seems to vaguely look at it that way, but this is not a very Googleable kind of question. So my question for anyone who this rings a bell for how to look at literal free energies and hopefully like the actual real free energies rather than standard ones, I would be very interested in thinking about what kind of processes can be modeled with a dissipative cycle like this? Now, the th important thing about Prigogine is he talks about how this, this logic, these dissipative cycles, do have a price because what you're dissipating is, you know, following along with the, um, the, the entropy increase of the universe. And in fact, part of that price has to do with human knowledge. You cannot know exactly which fluctuation will start the system. Uh, when, you, when you fluctuate the system by blowing on the cornstarch with a straw, yeah, you're fluctuating the system, you're starting it. But for the things that just start on their own, you can't predict where they will start, like the clock reaction and things like that. And likewise, this is related to that, after a certain point, you can't look back and reconstruct their history from the trajectories of all the molecules as much as you would like to. Some people say that, oh, if we just had enough computing power, we would be able to reconstruct the entire history of the universe. Um, Prigogine says that is a pipe dream. And so like reconstructing the universe from the trajectories of all the atoms inside a spaceship. Let's say, um, this is an example from Doctor Who itself. And they once reconstructed the entire universe from all of the trajectories of the atoms inside the TARDIS. And that is Newtonian. And that is what Prigogine says we cannot do. So I love the rest of that episode. 
But that one part um, drives me a little bit nuts because I'm like, we don't live in a universe where we can know these things. The limits to our knowledge are very important. So how does this all fit with Rene Girard? Well, Rene Girard literally has a dissipative dynamical system at a sociological level. He says that societies cohere because people imitate each other. That's kind of autocatalytic. When you look at someone else and you imitate what they do, you are catalyzing their actions in a sense. And the thing that Girard says is that number one, this is actually, this can be good, but it also can be very bad. If we all want the same thing and we can't all have it, we start to fight. What do we do when the fighting auto catalyzes itself and takes over the whole, um, the whole society? Well, the way that Rene Girard says societies have evolved to deal with this is to project all of their anger and frustration instead of on their neighbor, on a vulnerable scapegoat and to eject that scapegoat through exile or execution. So uh, the idea is that this is also the systems of sacrifice are a ritualized form of this. So Rene Girard's theory is very complicated. It's controversial on certain points, but I zero in on this idea that it is dissipative. It expels the chaos to maintain dynamic order within society. And so this is what they, they got to for the Rene Girard presented part of this, Prigogine presented part of his, and then they talked to each other. And uh, the reason why they called this is because they said that we have all this epistemological turmoil, which means we don't know what's going on. And we want to think about how these different fields come together. So you would think that the academic version of the story is that you would be able to um, to uh, bring these people together and they'd be able to talk it out and figure it out. But they actually got confused. It became like a Babel-like confusion. And like in Babel, they were using language in ways that the others didn't understand. I found it really interesting that um, to reconstruct this from the document that I had, they were disagreeing and there were physicists who were using turbulence and chaos as sort of the same thing and sort of different things they were shifting on that. And there were a few of the people who figured out that this was going on as it was happening. Uh, Prigogine's co-author, Isabel Stenger, um, basically pointed out that they were using the wrong definitions. They were using chaos as an equilibrium example, when Prigogine's ideas are deliberately non-equilibrium. Uh, so there are people who pointed out that this is not just some random chaos, this is a structured system and a structured organization of reactions rather than one reaction going to equilibrium. And uh, that's, this applies to Girard's ideas as well. And so I found these ideas where it seemed like they were getting to the right ideas, but then at that point, the conference ended. But the main thing is even then they were saying a circular arrangement of these actions might be some of the ways in which we produce order from chaos. So that's why I want to put all these things together. When I look at Girard and Prigogine together, I find these three similarities among them all. There is an important role for randomness among a group, and uh, that shows up in both of them. There's an important role for well-defined constraints. For Prigogine, it's entropy and knowledge. For Girard, it's the idea of taboos and rituals that are forming the, um, the ordered reactions among which society moves, okay? Um, I always feel like I'm almost getting myself in trouble because I probably am in bringing these chemical metaphors, um, but this is what they were trying to do. And I think that there might be a way forward if we focus on these three things. Each one depends on autocatalysis, mimesis in Girard, and Prigogine's brucellator, which I showed the reactions for that earlier. The thing I want to, and one of the reasons why I wanted to bring up Girard in the ASA, because he's a fascinating character, not a scientist, far from it but he was a literary critic and he actually moved through like Shakespeare and his readings of Dostoevsky and it led him to his mimetic theory. And his mimetic theory led him to the Bible as the living word that exposes the scapegoat mechanism and is the way that God is speaking to reveal the destructive nature of this copying of each other to, uh, to ourselves. Um, Girard actually compares his mimetic theory to Darwin which is a pretty big shoes to fill kind of thing. And I'm not, it doesn't apply entirely, but there are some ways in which mechanism uh, underlies the thinking of the theories of both of them. And I think it's fascinating to think about this 
instead of leading him away from faith, this led him to the faith. And I think as Christian scholars, I'm very interested in how that worked. And if anything, you know, Gerard had a trajectory of talking more and more about his faith throughout his life. So I want to bring this together with theological implications. And so here are some examples of the dynamical logic and the idea of this randomness, this random copying and scapegoating mechanism, where that can show up in the Bible, where Gerard saw that. The fact that we're bound to conflict might even be related to original sin, the fact that we want the things the other people want, and then we'll fight. It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. Uh, though the fact that the weak are scapegoated and the group projects its turmoil on them, that's Isaiah 53, and that's, of course, pretty much half of the New Testament talking about what Jesus did. And that's all the bad news. That's about the, uh, the fights that we get into because of copying each other. But the theological implications are, are good things because we know that the, the other half of the New Testament is God steps in, God floods our uh, creation with his light, and God works in ways that he is not bound by the scapegoat mechanism. When we reach our limits and we realize our own limits, God can step in, and that means we don't have to follow these rules of scapegoating that um, keep society together, but they work less and less well as time goes on. Um, so this is where John 3, 8, the wind blows wherever it pleases, like those born of the Spirit. And uh, Luke 23 has a little verse that talks about the women who had followed him stood at a distance as the crowd dispersed from the crucifixion. And that's an image that I keep thinking of whenever I read Gerard, that you stand when every all the other um, chaos is dispersing around you, and you just stand and you trust God in that. Literally, the word imitate, mimitai, is used frequently, but you imitate not your neighbor, you imitate God, as Jesus says, imitate my father, and you also imitate, we are called to imitate Christ. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so this is how God steps in. It's kind of like if you have a circle of reactions, there's, um, it's not a substance that's there. It's a dynamical arrangement, and there's a hole at the middle of it, like the hole in the donut. And it kind of seems like we have a porous creation that God can shine his light through. So uh, the practical conclusions, I think, come down to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount and what Jesus did on the cross, that we default to dissipate violence. And, you know, even in the ASA, we all think different things, and we will tend to fracture along those lines. And there's a difference between a healthy academic debate and then ad hominem scapegoating attacks. And it's very hard to avoid that. So we looked at the example of Jesus and imitate Christ as part of that. Um, no one can control the crowd seeking a scapegoat, but I can control myself and I can pray to the God who sees in secret to convert me in secret to the way of Christ. And so I want to just uh, remind myself and remind everyone of uh, Jesus's ethical program in the Sermon on the Mount that deliberately breaks the scapegoating cycle. And so it's the idea of if we have this chemical reaction that's going to like whirlpool and consume like a fire, it's going to uh, burn through the whole society. The way that we resist that is by um, imitating Christ and depending on the power of God from outside our system. And uh, hopefully we'll, I pray that we'll each work that out each day as we work out our salvation. These are what I think are the best ways to get into the thoughts of the different people that I've mentioned and that YouTube link. Thank you for your attention. I think we have like a minute or two for questions. Yeah, Chris, go first. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ben. Really interesting paper. As you know, uh, I'm a philosopher, not a scientist. Uh, <clears throat> making uh, some philosophical connections Work I'm doing on the Middle Ages, uh, Epistemology and Doctrine of God of Nominalism. Hmm. And uh, I don't have time because time's limited, but I'm making connections right now, various fields. And I just really want to thank you for this, such a stimulating paper. Yeah, Gerard started with his very first exposure to scapegoating was the witch hunt, hunt tr sort of trials yeah. where you had um, things that were clearly lies that were made up about the scapegoats, the witches in that case. And, uh, but he actually says that the witch hunts led to science because you were investigating whether these things happened, whether these witches, these scapegoats could have the power that they did. 
And science found out that they didn't. And it led to the scientific view of the universe where we realized that our accusations were actually scapegoating and they were lies from the father of lies. I think yeah. that's what I mean. So. Interesting. Thank you. I, we've run out of time, but I really encourage Ben and Charles and others in this session to start a discussion in the conversations because these are very interesting ideas and I would love to see them pursued. So I want to thank all the, the speakers today and all the participants and thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.